Well, hello and welcome to today's webinar. My name is Dwayne Butcher of Lean Frontiers and I will serve as your host today. Just a few points of logistics before we get started. Uh, today's short presentation is being recorded, so you can look for an email shortly after this session uh, with a link to an on-demand recording of the, this webinar. Please do share this with others in your organization and perhaps even use this recording as a lunch and learn uh, for others in your organization. Great way to spread the, uh, spread the content. There are materials available for download on the right side of your screen on the GoToWebinar toolbar. So uh, at any point you may download them, feel free to do so. Uh, and due to the short nature of this webinar, we will not be fielding questions. If you do have questions, uh, please email our presenter. She's provided her email address on this first slide and uh, we'll repeat that again later. So today's webinar is essentially a lead up to the Lean Coaching Summit, which actually takes place in the summer, July 31st and August 1st, on the beautiful island of Jekyll Island, which is just off the coast of Georgia. Uh, please do consider joining us for that event as we explore two important elements of Lean Coaching. And that would be the, that coaching requires a commitment of both the heart and the mind. And that's going to be the theme of this year's Lean Coaching Summit. You can learn more about the Coaching Summit by visiting LeanCoachingSummit.com. So with that said, let me introduce today's presenter, Katie Anderson. Katie is a Lean Leadership Coach and Performance Improvement Specialist with over 15 years of experience. For over a decade, Katie has led Lean development uh, across many industries, uh, including healthcare. In 2013, Katie started her own independent consulting practice focused on lean leadership, coaching, strategy, and implementation. It was during that time, Katie, if I understand correctly, that you lived for 18 months in Japan. Yes. Uh, and now you regularly travel back to Japan and actually bring folks along with you. So I'm hoping we have uh, at some point, maybe toward the end, a chance to talk more about that. So Great. for now though, Katie, I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to you and let you run with it. Great, well, thanks Dwayne. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here today and thanks everyone for joining us either um, live or later recorded. When I was thinking about the topic for today, the concept of specificity and how to be more specific came to mind because it has come up uh, a lot in my coaching and consulting work and facilitation of different sessions. So I thought about orienting some of the practices that I help leaders with around the concept of how do we deliver a great, create greater specificity in our organizations. So my intention today is to introduce, because of the short amount of time, and just introduce a few concepts to you and some things that you can tangibly start practicing today I also have a lot more resources on my website and I'll provide a link to that. Um, of course, you see that here today as well. Um, oh, and it's not letting me advance, but maybe it will here. There we go, great. So Dwayne gave a little bit of intro um, to who I am. You can see that here. I work with clients around the world and I am leading a study trip to Japan in this uh, next May of 2019. And we'll talk a little bit about that at the end. I held senior leadership roles at several healthcare organizations, and now I work with a variety of different industries and companies such as um, AME, LEI, Catalysis, and Ohio State University. So what do we mean by being specific, and why is this important? When I started putting this presentation together, I thought, well, I should get the definition of what being specific means. And it's about being clearly defined or identified and being precise and clear. So the more we can move from generalizations to specificity, we can create greater clarity in our organizations and really identify what we need to do to achieve greater value in our organizations, to create personal change, um, and really solve the problems that are in front of us. So specificity creates clarity. It's really all about unraveling the mess uh, and the problems that are in front of us, and it creates that clarity. You know, when we are asked to go solve a problem, it's really this messy, problematic condition that we have in front of us, but it's through this 
a, a rigorous problem solving process that we're really able to understand what's happening. So when we talk about specificity and being specific, how that relates to both problem solving and then um, coaching for personal development and improvement, that concept of specificity is really important. So the very fundamental nature of scientific thinking requires us to be specific. And the same, pro one of the reasons I really uh, like the A3 thinking framework that most of us are familiar with, really the rigorous scientific thinking of understanding your current condition, doing deep root cause analysis and putting in place countermeasures to um, our experiments is that it requires us to say what's actually happening and then identify specifically if we do something, what specifically do we anticipate is going to happen? I observe that people often talk in generalizations when they're first starting out in problem solving. So how can we great coach to uh, specificity? And as I said before, the, the very nature, and this is the A3 thinking flow, it really supports us to get very specific on all of these um, components to understand a problem. Specifically, what uh, is our current state? What's actually happening? What do you know? And how do you specifically know it? And what is the actual problem in specific performance terms? What specific outcome is required? So that's a, a clearly defined gap and that we get some clarity on that. And what are the root causes of that specific gap that we have identified? What specific countermeasures will we put in place and how do they link to the gap that we're wanting to close? When coaching um, problem solvers, I often notice that there isn't that direct link on the hypothesis of what we're going to do and, and how it actually links to the different root causes that have been identified. So how do we specifically identify those hypotheses and what we anticipate is going to happen? What's our specific action plan? And how are we gonna follow up? And the more specificity that we create along all of this is really what leads to the clarity. When I teach A3 thinking, I, we also talk about how data and facts influence our ability to know what's actually happening. And how when we use percentages and averages, they tend to be more um, give us a more general sense of what's happening. So this is just another example about how we can use data to be more specific and learn more. I was thinking back, uh, gosh, this was about seven or eight years ago when I was working at Lucille Packard Children's Hospital and the pediatric uh, cancer department came to me and said, we have this problem, it's been going on for years, we've tried to fix it, we have this average wait of over an hour, uh, and they weren't really able to impact that. And it was going through the data, and really, and I share this graph just as an example, where we, we did direct observations and discovered that the range of waiting time, uh, it was, yes, there was an average wait of 63 minutes, but you know there were some, poor children out here waiting for two, three, four, or over six hours. And there were some who are getting their appointments right on time. And this allowed us to do then that deep dive into each of those areas to understand what was working well when there wasn't very much waiting and what really was going wrong in these times that were um, over an hour or even over 15 minutes. So the more we can be specific and see what's actually happening, we can do some more rigorous thinking and great, create greater clarity on what's happening. Similarly, with, uh, we're, along with solving or working through operational problems and processes, we can also use that same rigorous thinking for working on our own personal improvement. If we consider ourselves also business conditions that require improvements in order to achieve what we want in our organizations. Habits theory is really aligned with um, the same rigorous plan, do, study, adjust model, and along with A3 thinking. And I wanna just quickly give you an overview of what this could look like. I have a lot more information on my website and have written about this extensively. But really understanding what are my specific current happen, habits and what happens as a result of that. What does better look like specifically for me? What is my experiment to get better and what is my process for getting or, you know, when my old habits emerge? What steps will I take when I when, to practice? And what am I specifically going to do? And I'm going to talk a little bit more around this concept of specificity as it relates to habit development. And this is around the A3 thinking flow for personal improvement. For your current state, you really want to be thinking about my current habits and what I specifically do. Uh, this is the same flow 
as it would, was with the problem solving process as well. But what I, there are two challenges that I uh, often see when people are starting to use A3 thinking. And I'm moving quickly to this slide too, because this is a really important one around the difference between traits and behaviors. So this is the first, the first challenge I see is that people are, have the habit of focusing on uh, problems outside of themselves. So if they're starting a personal improvement A3, they may actually work on a organizational problem or maybe a team dynamics problem, but talking about other people. When you're looking at a personal improvement A3, you really want to be looking at yourself. What do I personally do and what is the impact of what I do? So it's not about other people, but it's about my own actions. And then along with that, being specific on behaviors of what you do, not necessarily a generalized trait. For example, you may want to be someone who is considered a, um, a humble leader. So what are the specific behaviors that would describe someone who is a humble leader? For example, maybe it's going uh, to Gemba, going to the workplace uh, regularly, asking questions such as what is or how to uh, support the development of other people. So really being specific on what are the actions that you take. And that then aligns with the habit uh, research. Uh, you know, it's not that you just wanna lose 10 pounds or fit into your swimsuit by summer, but what are the specific steps that you need to take to get there? So this is where specificity really allows us to understand how we're going to change and what are the things that get in our way. So I'm not gonna go into great de much more detail around the personal improvement A3 thinking process here, but it's just a way for you to have some structured thinking for yourself for improvement as well as coaching others as well. And you can go to my website for more, more details. And it's really this concept of having a keystone habit where you're practicing both problem solving thinking as well as um, personal improvement. What I wanted to get into for the second half is really what are some other specific coaching practices that you can start incorporating into your, um, in, into your daily practice to help support greater specificity either for yourself or others. So the first practice is setting a specific intention. And Duane talked about connecting the heart and the mind. I went in this, the concept of intentionality really in my mind um, is that connection between heart and mind. When I moved to Japan, I put the word for intention on my business card and the symbols in the Japanese kanji characters came back uh, and I le later learned that they mean heart and direction. And so your intention is a really knowing what's important in your heart and, and what's your purpose? And are you aligning yourself in the direction with your behaviors there? So when I say to set your specific intention, it's taking a pause or a moment to ground yourself in how am I supposed to be behaving in this moment? What's really important? What's my purpose in this interaction? And what's my specific plan for then how I'm going to behave in service of that intention? For myself, I have found this really helpful, setting this specific pause or just grounding myself in that purpose before going into a coaching session, uh, before even interacting with my children. Uh, what, what is my purpose? And then I have a chance to reflect on, did I actually behave that way? I also encourage leaders to use um, tools such as leader standard work or visual systems to also set specific intentions. For example, if you have Gemba rounds, going to the workplace to check on something, identify what you're specifically going to check in advance and communicate that to the people as well. Or if there's a topic for a meeting, a regular recurring meeting, what's the specific purpose for that meeting? We often used at the Palo Alto Medical Foundation, one of the organizations I worked at, just a simple process for meeting agendas, purpose, process, and payoff as the uh, structure for our meeting agendas. So identifying that specific purpose in the process really helped people stay grounded and stay focused on the meeting. So setting that specific intention can be a really important practice for yourself and others. The second as a coach or a leader is to label it. Be specific and about what you're doing and be specific and clear on what you're doing. For example, when I'm facilitating a workshop or even when I'm in a coaching session, I will make visible 
what I'm doing to the people in the room. For example, I might ask a question and then let some silence happen. After that, so that people can speak. After that time, I will then say, I wanna make visible to what I am doing. You make it visible to you what I am doing. I just counted to 10 in my head because I have a habit of jumping in too quickly. So then makes that specificity of my intentional practice also helps them understand and see one, there was intention around it, and two, then conceive that maybe that is a practice they could uh, incorporate them for themselves. I also will identify if I'm having a, asking a clarifying question so that someone knows that that is the intention behind it, or that I've observed that you are stuck, or saying I'm putting my teaching hat on and stepping out of a pure coaching role. The more we can label it and be specific about the purpose of our actions, it can help the people that we are supporting understand uh, why we're doing what we're doing, as well as um, modeling the way. The third tip is about giving specific observable evidence. We often talk about giving feedback, which can be good, but the challenge with feedback at times is that it can introduce judgment or emotion around it. When we are specific in providing actual observable evidence, it takes the emotional side out. One way to do this is to write down, say verbatim, what someone is saying in a meeting and providing that as evidence of the quality of the questions that they were asking. If they were you know, trying to maybe ask, practice asking better questions and not speak as much in meetings. I've also used this as a way of noting when I've been in organizations where there's the culture of it's okay to go in and out of the room all the time or people being on the phone, just making a notation on who went out of the room when or who was opening their phones or how many times people were doing something. This is a way to provide specific observable evidence that's without judgment and then allows for some conversation and reflection after that. So think about how you can be specific and stick with evidence rather than just feedback. Another coaching practice that you can incorporate is about asking for a specific example when you are having a discussion, when a group's having a discussion or you're facilitating a session. For example, uh, just a few weeks ago, I was facilitating a two day workshop on A3 thinking, and we use John Shook's Managing to Learn as the framework for, for the learning session. And I'll project on the screen um, the, the new A3 of Porter, who's the learner who's working through his A3. Well, we asked the group say, you know, what do you observe in this draft of Porter's A3? And someone might say, oh, you know, I noticed that he talked to more people. If I don't, as the facilitator, I could leave it like that. But if I ask a follow-up question asking for a specific example, it can make that person's thinking visible to everyone else and also go into deeper conversation and discussion. So for example, I might ask a follow-up question like, what in this scenario, and show me visually on this A3, specifically led you to, scri to describe it that way? I've also found that asking for some specific uh, ideas or comments from someone when they ask a question can be a really helpful way as a coach to understand what's behind the question that is being asked. Typically, when someone asks a question, they've done a little bit of thinking on that topic. So asking for what is one thought you have about that or what is one idea you um, have been considering about approaching that. It allows the person to be doing more talking and also gives you as the coach more evidence on how much thinking or they have done or where they're truly stuck in the process. So that's a good habit to develop uh, when you're not just wanting to, you know, not, someone asks you a question and just you answering it it starts bringing forward more thinking. And the fifth tip is to establish a specific process for practice. I like um, the, you know, the concepts of leader standard, standard work and visual systems are there as tools to really support the development of new habits, including uh, daily self-reflection, including where you're going to go at different times of the week and when. It helps us be specific in our practice plan and then have something to uh, reflect specifically on, we had a plan, what did we do, and what happened 
uh, what were the reasons uh, we either were on or off track with our actual plan. So again, this gets back to the concept of setting your intention. It's about setting that specific process for practice as well. And the study is an adjust um, component of both problem solving and developing new and better habits is really what is so critical to the process of learning and getting better. And something that I've observed that we don't do as well in the West and that perhaps um, that you know, other, some other cultures are better at doing deeper reflection and learning. I wanna end with a quote that maybe some of you have seen me share before. And this was actually at the Lean Coaching Summit in 2014, right when I found out that our family was going to move to Japan. And John Shook and his mentor, Asao Yoshino, who was actually the Sanderson to John Shook's porter in the book Managing to Learn, were up on stage talking about their role as manager and uh, subordinate. And I've always just found this really profound in terms of describing, this is Mr. Yoshino talking about describing the role of a manager for supporting both problem solving and personal development. So he said, my aim was to develop John by giving him a mission or target and supporting him while he figured out how to reach the target. And as I was developing John, I was aware that I was developing myself as well. So this is about not just us coaching other people, but how are we improving ourselves as coaches and leaders in service of doing that? So. Hopefully some of the tips that I've shared today can help give you some ideas of other things that you can incorporate into your practice as well. And I wanna to close today uh, by asking you to set your intention for your practice, identify at least one thing that you are going to specifically practice with intention over the next month, and then also identify how will you know that you're improving. This doll there is a um, Japanese Daruma, and I have one of my own here. This is actually, uh, a, when you have a goal, you fill in the left eye of the Daruma. And this is a very big one that I got, but I have a big goal. Mr. Yoshino and I are writing a book on timeless leadership principles, and I am in the process of writing that now. So this is a big project of mine. When I fill in, well, when I achieve my goal, I'll be able to fill in the right eye. And it's about perseverance. Um, it's weighted, I can't do this on my hand, but it's about when you, get knocked down to keep writing yourself up. So set your intention, make your goal visible, and continue to refine and um, revise it and get back up if you uh, get knocked down. I have some resources for you here, um, for the specifically for the listeners of the Lean Frontiers web, webinar here at kbjanderson.com backslash Lean Frontiers. I have some links to the Personal Improvement Coaching Guide, A3 Coaching Guide, some other um, resources that might be helpful for you. I also have a special, special offer for um, folks who are listening to this webinar who are maybe interested in joining my Japan trip. You can also contact me as well. So thank you so much. Uh, it's been a pleasure talking with you. Katie, uh, thank you so much, not, not only for sharing with us some of your thoughts today, but uh, really going back for, for several years in your thought leadership in the, the Lean Coaching Summit and in that community, you've you've been a great contributor both at the summit and then in between the summits through your many contributions. So thank you. Thanks, Wayne. So just a couple of things I wanted to, to talk about. I, I was really interested in your Japan trip. And matter of fact, I asked you a couple questions about that because I would love to go myself. I know. I'd love to it's have you. In May. Yes, it's Correct. happening. Yes, in uh, May of 2019, the week of May 12th, and it's a five and a half day uh, trip that it also includes about at least three days where Mr. Yoshino is going to be joining the group, not just giving lectures and seminars, which um, he does for other groups, but spending the full day with us, going to site visits, joining for meals on the buses, and so an opportunity to really get to spend some time with him and get to know um, him which is real it was a real treat that's an a that's an amazing part of that trip to be able to have that time with mr yoshino yeah for sure uh, yeah you, you don't get that on most most trips like this so no no i'm really honored that he's um you know for do, for our friendship he's willing to or you know he's he loves meeting other people and, and is going to yeah. do that as well i'm also excited about you know i did a trip i led a trip this past may and continuing to build on that I'm going uh, out to Japan in February and sourcing a few new places or following up on some contacts that I've built over my the last four years. So I'm excited to be adding some new fresh, fresh locations to the trip. 
as well as revisiting my uh, friend, Mrs. Noriko Orgura, who is a female leader of a manufacturing company, which is very rare in Japan. Mm. And, and she's, she shares her experience of not only being a lean leader and developing a culture of continuous improvement, but really how that has been for her as a female in Japan. So mm. I'm, that's a fun sort of other, other aspect of what we have to offer. Yeah. You know, I've, I've had the privilege of learning from so many uh, thought leaders in, the, in, our, in our lean community. But what has always struck me is when I have the opportunity to sit with somebody like Mr. Yoshino or those that have worked in, at Toyota in, in the past, I learn more from the way they interact, mm. sometimes in the offline conversations about what it means uh, to, to live a culture at Toyota. Um, I, I saw that in, I don't know if you know Mike Hoseas, uh, he yes. wrote a book with, uh, but I, I learned more from him through some of the stories he's told about his his time at, uh, at Toyota. So anyway, I don't want to overemphasize it, but what a great opportunity to spend time yeah. with Mr. Yoshino. Well, thanks. We'll have to get you on another trip in the future, yeah. Dwayne. Yeah, that'd be great. Uh, so I, I just had a friend who went on um, a, a different trip to Japan and he came back and this is not hyperbole. He literally described it as life changing. Um, I, I'm curious, why why would that be? Why would a trip and seeing some of these these uh, places that you'll visit? Why why does it have such an impact on people? Well, that's a great that's a great question. You know, as I had that experience of going and living in Japan for 18 months, and and you certainly don't have to go to Japan to learn a lot about what it means to be a practicing and applying lean thinking in your organization or for yourself. Uh, my experience of why it was life-changing for me personally was to really discover uh, more deeply what were the principles that were more inherently Japanese and what were the uh, the concepts that really actually are quite challenging for uh, Japanese as a whole around what we might consider lean thinking and practice and how not all of Japan is like Toyota. And mm. to me, that really uh, helps us understand that it isn't about just Japan or isn't about just Toyota, that there are these um, principles that really have been come from the East and the West and brought together that challenge us, us all to get better in our organizations. And it doesn't necessarily make it easier or harder depending on our national culture. It's just, just what's specifically easier or harder for us as individuals or maybe a company or a culture might differ. Yeah. And then of course, just the amazing customer service and the cleanliness and uh, just some of that rich culture that is in Japan is just really, uh, it's just fascinating from, from my perspective in the food, <laughs> <laughs> but, from, but as a lean practitioner, I think just seeing what are some of the things that are done really deeply well in some aspects of, um, different companies. And then, you know, also seeing that it's not across the board and, and, just having an opportunity to step away from the day-to-day -to -day too. Yeah. So this, my next question may touch on uh, the, the food part of what you're talking about. Um, if maybe if somebody's a travel novice, um, uh, what, what might they expect from this trip? Do they need to know a lot about how to get from place to place? And, and then uh, I, I talk about the food because I'm a I'm a meat and potatoes kind of guy. Am I going to be okay in Japan? Yes. Oh my gosh. Well, the, not as many potatoes, but the you know the the wagyu beef is unparalleled in in Japan. Yeah. In fact, my kids don't like uh, sushi, and I'm sort of uh, I like some fish, but not not um, to the degree of the the many of the Japanese. But the the amount of different types of food, yakiniku is all grilled meat done at your table, yeah. uh, yakitori, which are the chicken skewers, lots of fresh vegetables. So there is a wide range of food and it's not all raw, raw fish. <laughs> not so many potatoes, but you got the rice. So, you know, you I can, can get your carbs. The rice. Yes. <laughs> and rice so in, ter in terms of the, the, the travel experience in it, itself, um, I, I'm assuming there's transportation. Oh yeah, we take forth. care of Yes, we take care of all of that once you arrive. Yeah. yeah. Well, I uh, I have penciled it on my my things to do 
uh, my, my bucket list is to join right. you on a, on a trip to Japan. All right. so. 2020. Yeah. Great. <laughs> well, thanks, Dwayne. And uh, anyone on the webinar, please feel free to reach out to me both um, on any of the concepts that we talked, we just briefly introduced today uh, or about the Japan trip or, or anything else. You have my contact information here. Great. Well, thank you very much, Katie. And uh, thank thanks. you everyone who participated in today's webinar and look for an email from us uh, shortly with a recording to this session. Great. Thanks and have a great, great day. Thanks.